As the winds of World War II unfolded globally, tank warfare played a crucial role in shaping battles. The clash of armored forces showcased technological capabilities and highlighted strategic intelligence. Within the array of tanks deployed in combat, some, regrettably, fell short of their intended effectiveness. Whether due to design flaws, operational shortcomings, or a combination, these tanks were categorized as the least effective. So join us as we explore the pages of military history to reveal the top five most useless tanks of World War II. Transformative Battles of World War II World War II witnessed a transformative era in military history, marked by unprecedented technological advancements and strategic innovations. Among the numerous facets of warfare, tank warfare emerged as a critical element, fundamentally reshaping the dynamics of ground conflicts. The roots of tank warfare can be traced back to the First World War, when the introduction of armored vehicles revolutionized battlefield tactics. However, in World War II, tanks came into their own, playing a pivotal role in shaping the course of battles and campaigns. The major powers engaged in the conflict, including Germany, the Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom, heavily invested in developing and deploying tanks. One of the defining characteristics of tank warfare in World War II was the diverse range of tank designs and doctrines employed by different nations. Germany, for instance, fielded the highly effective Panzer divisions, which combined speed, firepower, and maneuverability to achieve battlefield superiority. The Blitzkrieg tactics, characterized by swift and coordinated tank-led offensives, allowed Germany to conquer large swaths of territory in the early stages of the war. On the Eastern Front, the Soviet Union faced the brunt of the German onslaught, but responded with mass-produced, rugged tanks such as the T-34. With its sloped armor and powerful 76mm gun, the T-34 proved a game-changer, offering a formidable counter to the German panzers. The Eastern Front became a theater where the clash of tank titans determined the course of many battles. Simultaneously, the Western Allies, primarily the United States and the United Kingdom, developed their tank doctrines. The M4 Sherman, a versatile and widely produced American tank, played a crucial role in the Allied campaigns in North Africa, Italy, and Western Europe. While less technologically advanced than some of its counterparts, Sherman's reliability and numerical superiority contributed significantly to the Allied war effort. The Pacific Theater, with its challenging terrain and island-hopping campaigns, presented a unique set of challenges for tank warfare. Amphibious tanks, like the Sherman Duplex drive tanks, allowed Allied forces to adapt to the demands of amphibious assaults and island warfare. Key battles in World War II underscored the importance of tanks in determining the outcome of engagements. The Battle of Kursk in 1943, often regarded as the largest tank battle in history, witnessed a clash between German and Soviet armored forces. The Soviets, leveraging their numerical advantage and superior tanks like the T-34, dealt a decisive blow to the German offensive. Kursk marked a turning point on the Eastern Front, signaling the decline of German momentum. On the Western Front, the Battle of Normandy saw the Allies employing tanks with infantry and air support to establish a beachhead and break through German defenses. The success of these operations highlighted the effectiveness of integrated combined arms tactics, with tanks playing a central role. As the war progressed, technological advancements further influenced tank design and capabilities. Tanks evolved with improved armor, more powerful guns, and enhanced mobility. Introducing tanks with sloped armor, such as the Soviet T-34 and the German Panther, increased their resilience against enemy fire. The development of tank destroyers, specialized vehicles designed to counter enemy tanks, added a new dimension to armored warfare. The concept of tank warfare in World War II also extended beyond traditional armored divisions. Commanders increasingly recognized the importance of infantry and tank cooperation, emphasizing combined arms tactics. Tanks provided cover and support for infantry assaults, and infantry units were trained to coordinate with tank formations, exemplified in the concept of the tank infantry team. The aftermath of World War II witnessed a profound impact on military doctrine and the continued evolution of tank warfare. 
Lessons learned from the conflict influenced the development of post-war armored forces and shaped the Cold War era military strategies. The concept of rapid, decisive maneuver warfare, inspired by the Blitzkrieg tactics, persisted as a central tenet in the doctrines of many nations. Now let's examine the five least effective tanks of World War II. Number five, Somua S-35. The Somua S-35, officially designated as the Char de Cavalerie S-35, emerged from the innovative efforts of the French company Société du Tillage, Mécanique et du Sinage d'Artillerie, Somua, in the mid-1930s. As Europe grappled with the aftermath of World War I, military thinkers sought to revolutionize armored warfare, learning valuable lessons from the conflict's trench-bound nature. In response to these insights, Somua endeavored to create a breakthrough tank that would embody the evolving concepts of modern armored warfare. The result was the S-35, designed with a focus on advanced armor protection and firepower. Drawing from the experiences of its predecessor, the Somua S-35 was envisioned as a versatile and formidable asset on the battlefield. The tank's development coincided with a period marked by significant technological advancements and strategic shifts in military thinking. With the specter of a new conflict looming, the Somua S-35 aimed to reconcile the harsh realities of trench warfare with the emerging principles of maneuverability and versatility, setting the stage for its role in the evolving landscape of World War II tank warfare. The Somua S-35's remarkable armor set it apart as a formidable force on the battlefield. The frontal armor, with its effective sloping design and a maximum thickness of 47 millimeters, offered robust protection against various contemporary tank weapons. This emphasis on defensive capabilities enhanced the tank's survivability, particularly in head-to-head -head combat scenarios. Regarding armament, the S-35 was armed with a 47mm SA-35 gun, which demonstrated effectiveness against enemy tanks during its era. The tank's offensive capabilities allowed the crew to engage both armored and infantry targets. Additionally, a hull-mounted machine gun served dual purposes, acting as an anti-infantry weapon and providing a degree of anti-aircraft capability. The combination of solid armor and a well-rounded armament showcased the Somua S-35's intent to be a versatile and capable medium tank on the ever-evolving battlefield of World War II. The Somua S-35, while showcasing commendable armor and firepower, encountered notable challenges in the realms of design and mobility. At the core of its issues was the Samua V8 petrol engine, a power plant that boasted 190 horsepower. This engine seemed robust on paper, yet its performance could have improved when propelling the relatively weighty tank. The consequence of this power struggle was a top speed that peaked at approximately 25 km per hour, or 15.5 mph. In the dynamic and fast-paced landscape of World War II battlefield scenarios where agility and swift movement were paramount, the Somua S-35's sluggish speed emerged as a glaring Achilles heel. The choice of a Samua V-8 engine, while offering reliability in terms of power delivery, ultimately failed to deliver the level of mobility required for effective armored warfare. This limitation impacted the tank's ability to respond rapidly to changing tactical situations hampering its overall battlefield utility. The era demanded tanks capable of executing rapid maneuvers, and the Somua S-35's constrained speed undermined its potential in the evolving theater of armored warfare. Beyond its challenges in speed and mobility, the Somua S-35 struggled with reliability issues that cast a shadow over its operational effectiveness. The tank's intricate mechanical components, coupled with the demands imposed by its considerable weight and design complexity, contributed to frequent breakdowns and maintenance headaches. The crews operating the S-35 found themselves grappling with a litany of mechanical failures, ranging from engine malfunctions to transmission issues. The high-maintenance nature of the Somua S-35 meant that it required constant attention and upkeep, diverting resources and time away from crucial battlefield activities. The breakdowns not only hindered the tank's ability to remain operational during critical moments, but also eroded the confidence of the crews in the reliability of their equipment. 
As the tank crews faced the challenges of maintaining and repairing their vehicles under the pressures of wartime conditions, the S-35's reliability issues became a significant operational concern. These mechanical shortcomings affected the tank's overall combat readiness, limiting its effectiveness in sustained operations. The unreliability of the Samua S-35 was particularly evident during the intense engagements of the German invasion of France in 1940. In a fast-moving and fluid battlefield environment, where reliability was paramount for success, the S-35's tendency to break down or require extensive maintenance became a liability. The reliability issues plaguing the Samua S-35 and its relatively slow speed created a challenging environment for the tank and its crews. While the tank showcased strengths in terms of armor and firepower, these advantages were overshadowed by the operational difficulties arising from its mechanical vulnerabilities. As a result, the Samua S-35's legacy is one of a tank that, despite its initial promise, struggled to meet the demanding requirements of modern armored warfare due to its design, mobility, and reliability limitations. Number 4. Type 95. Hago, Japan's light tank. The Type 95 Hago, a light tank developed and employed by the Imperial Japanese Army during the Second World War, holds a distinctive place in the annals of armored warfare. While the tank showcased certain strengths, it was marred by notable flaws that limited its overall effectiveness on the battlefield. The Type 95 Hago, officially known as the Kyugo Shiki Keisensha, was designed in the early 1930s and entered service in 1936. The tank was intended to replace the older Type 89 Igo medium tank, providing the Imperial Japanese Army with a more modern and versatile light tank. Weighing approximately 7 tons, the Hago was characterized by its compact size and relatively light armor. Its main armament consisted of a Type 94 37mm tank gun, complemented by one or two 7.7mm Type 97 machine guns. The tank's design reflected the Japanese military doctrine of the time, which emphasized infantry support and rapid maneuverability. One of the notable features of the Hago was its thin armor. With armor thickness ranging from 6mm to 12mm, the tank offered limited protection against enemy fire. While this allowed for increased speed and maneuverability, it also made the Hago vulnerable to even light anti-tank weapons and machine gun fire. The tank was powered by a Mitsubishi A6120VD air-cooled six-cylinder diesel engine, providing a top speed of around 45 km per hour, equivalent to 28 miles per hour. The Hago's mobility was a relative strength, allowing it to navigate challenging terrains and execute rapid flanking maneuvers. This aspect of the tank was aligned with the Japanese military's emphasis on the strategic use of light tanks in fast-paced and fluid battlefield scenarios. Despite its contribution to the Japanese armored forces, the Type 95 Hago was plagued by significant flaws that hampered its effectiveness in combat. The most glaring weakness of the Hago was its thin armor, a compromise made in favor of increased speed and agility. This left the tank vulnerable to enemy fire, especially against tanks and anti-tank weaponry with more substantial calibers. The thin armor became a critical limitation as the war progressed, and more advanced and heavily armored enemy tanks became prevalent. While the Type 94 37mm tank gun was suitable for engaging lightly armored targets and infantry, more was needed against more formidable opponents. The tank's main armament lacked the punch needed to take on heavily armored tanks, putting the Hago at a disadvantage in head-to-head -head engagements. The Hago faced challenges in terms of mechanical reliability. The tank's components were less robust than some contemporaries, leading to breakdowns and maintenance issues. In the harsh and varied environments of the Pacific Theater, the Hago's mechanical vulnerabilities became more pronounced, affecting its operational readiness. As the war progressed, the Type 95 Hago became increasingly outdated. Unlike some other tanks that could be upgraded with improved armor, firepower, and other features, the Hago lacked the capacity for significant modifications. This rendered it less adaptable to the changing demands of the battlefield and contributed to its diminishing relevance as the conflict unfolded. The Type 95 Hago saw action in various theaters, including China and the Pacific Islands, 
where it engaged enemy forces in the early years of the war. The tank demonstrated a degree of success against poorly equipped and lightly armored opponents, aligning with its intended role as an infantry support vehicle. However, as the war progressed and the Allies fielded more advanced tanks with superior firepower and armor, the limitations of the Hago became increasingly apparent. It struggled in the face of well-armored adversaries, and its vulnerabilities made it a challenging asset to deploy against the evolving Allied armored formations. The Type 95 Hago, despite its flaws, played a role in the early stages of the Pacific conflict. Its deployment showcased the Japanese military's approach to light tank warfare, emphasizing mobility and infantry support. However, the tank's inherent weaknesses limited its effectiveness, especially as the nature of armored warfare evolved during the course of World War II. The Hago's legacy lies in its representation of the challenges faced by Japanese armor during the war. It highlighted the difficulties associated with balancing mobility, firepower, and protection. As the war progressed, the shortcomings of the Hago underscored the need for more advanced and adaptable tank designs, prompting the Japanese military to develop newer models to contend with the changing dynamics of armored warfare. Number 3 the Soviet T-35. The Soviet T-35 is a tank that stands out not only for its sheer size, but also for its unique and unconventional design. Introduced in the interwar period, the T-35 was an ambitious attempt by the Soviet Union to create a heavily armored, multi-turreted behemoth that could dominate the battlefield. However, despite its imposing appearance and innovative features, the T-35 had its share of quirks and challenges that affected its combat performance during World War II. The T-35 was an unprecedented creation in terms of its scale and complexity. With its massive hull and five turrets, including one main turret housing a 76.2mm KT-28 gun, two smaller turrets with 45mm 20K guns, and two more with 7.62mm DT machine guns, the tank presented an intimidating presence on the battlefield. The idea behind the multiple turrets was to allow the T-35 to engage multiple targets simultaneously, creating a mobile fortress that could dominate its opponents. However, the tank's enormous size posed both logistical and tactical challenges. Weighing around 45 tons, the T-35 required specialized transport and maintenance facilities. Its sheer length and width made it a conspicuous target on the battlefield, diminishing its ability to use terrain for cover effectively. While the T-35 was designed with the intention of being a versatile and powerful force, its mobility left much to be desired. Powered by a 500-horsepower engine, the tank struggled with its considerable weight, resulting in a top speed of around 30 kilometers per hour, or 18.6 miles per hour on roads. Off-road performance was even more challenging, as the tank's size and weight made it prone to getting stuck in difficult terrain. The lack of agility was a critical flaw, especially considering the evolving nature of armored warfare during World War II. The T-35's cumbersome nature made it vulnerable to more maneuverable opponents, particularly in dynamic and fast-paced engagements. Its limited speed and maneuverability hindered its ability to exploit tactical opportunities or respond swiftly to changing battlefield conditions. With its multiple turrets and the need for a sizable crew to operate them, the T-35 presented a unique set of challenges when it came to crew coordination. The tank required 11 crew, a commanding officer, gunners, loaders, and a driver for each turret. Communicating and coordinating actions among such a large crew in the heat of battle proved formidable. The complexity of crew coordination impacted the tank's overall efficiency on the battlefield. Engaging multiple targets simultaneously, as intended, required seamless communication and coordination among the crew members. However, the practicalities of managing such a large crew in the confined spaces of the tank often led to delays and inefficiencies, reducing the tank's effectiveness in combat. The T-35 saw limited combat during the early stages of World War II, primarily on the Eastern Front. Its first significant engagement occurred during the Soviet invasion of Poland in 1939. While the tank demonstrated its imposing presence, the challenges posed by its size, mobility, and crew coordination became evident. 
When the Soviet Union faced the German invasion in 1941, the T-35 found itself outmatched by more modern and tactically nimble German tanks. The German Panzer III and IV, equipped with better mobility and firepower, easily outmaneuvered the T-35 on the battlefield. Its imposing size made it a conspicuous target, and its mobility issues made it vulnerable to the blitzkrieg tactics employed by the Germans. The T-35's legacy lies in its uniqueness and the challenges it posed to traditional tank design. While its massive size and multiple turrets were awe-inspiring, they also highlighted the difficulties of creating such a complex and ambitious war machine. The limitations of the T-35 became more apparent as World War II progressed and armored warfare evolved. The lessons learned from the T-35's design and combat performance contributed to the refinement of Soviet tank doctrine. The Soviet Union shifted its focus towards more practical and versatile tank designs, emphasizing mobility, firepower, and ease of production. Number 2. American Tank M3 The American Tank M3, commonly known as the M3 Lee or Grant, holds a distinctive place in the history of armored warfare during World War II. While it played a crucial role in the early stages of the conflict, the M3 was not without its flaws, which in turn, shaped its legacy on the battlefield. The M3 Lee, named after Confederate General Robert E. Lee, was designed and produced by the American Locomotive Company and the Pressed Steel Car Company. In many respects, it was an unconventional tank featuring a unique layout that deviated from the more conventional designs of the time. The tank was intended to serve as a stopgap measure, providing the Allies with sufficient armored vehicles as they ramped up their production capabilities for more advanced tanks. One of the notable features of the M3 Lee was its dual-purpose armament. The tank was equipped with a 75mm M2M3 gun mounted in a sponson on the right side of the hull and a 37mm M5 gun in a fully rotating turret. The rationale behind this design was to create a tank that could provide effective fire support against enemy tanks and infantry. While this concept had its merits, it introduced a significant drawback, the tank's high profile. The M3 Lee's tall silhouette made it an easy target on the battlefield. Its elevated hull, housing the 75mm gun, was susceptible to enemy fire, compromising the tank's overall survivability. In a theater of war where the ability to present a smaller target was paramount, the M3 Lee's design put it at a disadvantage. German tank crews, accustomed to more compact and maneuverable tanks, found targeting and engaging the M3 Lee relatively more straightforward. Another notable limitation of the M3 Lee was its restricted mobility. The tank was powered by a Wright R975 EC2 radial engine, producing 400 horsepower. While the engine itself was reliable, the tank's weight and the suspension design impacted its speed and agility. The M3 Lee's top speed was around 26 miles per hour, which, while not exceptionally slow, did not match the mobility of some of its contemporaries. This lack of speed made it challenging for the M3 Lee to keep up with faster-moving armored units on the battlefield, hindering its ability to execute rapid maneuvers or retreat from unfavorable situations. Additionally, the M3 Lee's suspension system posed its own challenges. The tank utilized a vertical volute spring suspension, a system that, while providing a relatively smooth ride, had limitations in terms of off-road performance. The M3 Lee struggled in rough terrain, reducing its overall versatility. In dynamic and fluid battle scenarios, where terrain could vary significantly, the M3 Lee's limitations in off-road mobility became a notable drawback. Crew comfort and ergonomics were also areas where the M3 Lee fell short. The tank's interior was cramped and lacked the amenities that would later become standard in tank design. Positioning the 75mm gun in the hull resulted in a crowded and uncomfortable space for the crew, especially the driver. This compromised the crew's efficiency and added to the overall challenges of operating the tank in prolonged combat situations. Despite these flaws, the M3 Lee found itself thrust into significant combat engagements early in World War II. It saw action in North Africa, where it faced German and Italian forces. The tank's firepower proved effective against the Axis armor, 
but its design limitations became evident, especially in battles where maneuverability and survivability were paramount. The M3 Lee's role as a stopgap measure became apparent as more advanced tank designs, such as the M4 Sherman, began to replace it in frontline service. The Sherman addressed many flaws in the M3 Lee, featuring a lower profile, a more powerful and efficient engine, and improved suspension. As the Sherman became more prevalent, the M3 Lee was gradually phased out of frontline combat roles, relegated to secondary duties, or transferred to allied nations through Lend-Lease programs. Despite its shortcomings, the M3 Lee left an indelible mark on the history of armored warfare. Its unconventional design, flaws, and all contributed to the lessons learned by allied tank designers. The tank's dual-purpose armament concept, while not fully realized in the M3 Lee itself, paved the way for more successful designs in the future. Though relatively short-lived in frontline combat, the M3 Lee's service played a crucial role in the broader context of World War II, influencing subsequent tank development and shaping the evolution of armored warfare. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. The Soviet T-26 light tank, though initially envisioned as a promising addition to military hardware, faced significant challenges. Born in the early 1930s, when the Soviet Union sought inspiration from Western tank designs, the T-26 drew heavily from the British Vickers six-ton tank. This model, admired by the Soviets for its balanced firepower, armor, and mobility, served as an ideal starting point for Soviet designers aiming to create a tank that could support infantry and perform surveillance. However, despite the good intentions and on-paper advantages, the T-26 encountered issues in its execution and adaptation to evolving warfare. While initially armed with a potent setup, including a 45mm gun and a coaxial machine gun, the tank faced mechanical failures in the heat of battle, leading to breakdowns and crew strandings. The tank's relatively thin armor, suitable against infantry weapons at the time, became obsolete as anti-tank weapons improved. The T-26's slow speed made it vulnerable to enemy infantry and aircraft, hindering its effectiveness on the battlefield, where speed and agility were increasingly crucial. Although the tank saw use during the Spanish Civil War, its shortcomings became apparent in demanding combat scenarios. Despite these warning signs, the Soviet Union continued mass production of the T-26. When World War II broke out, the T-26 constituted a significant portion of the Soviet tank forces, but its flaws were brutally exposed during the German invasion. The tank suffered heavy losses due to enemy action and mechanical unreliability, contributing to the staggering losses faced by the Red Army in the war's initial phase. Despite its failures, the T-26 played a role in shaping Soviet tank design. The lessons from its shortcomings influenced future tanks, leading to more reliable and effective designs. The T-26's legacy is a mixed one. On the one hand, it introduced concepts and technologies that were refined in later models. On the other hand, it serves as a cautionary tale about the perils of overlooking the realities of warfare in the design process. The T-26 was a product of its time, when tank design was still in its infancy, and the harsh battlefield lessons were yet to be fully understood. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Number 1. French Char B-1 Bis The Char B-1 Bis, a French heavy tank deployed during World War II, is a testament to the complexities and challenges armored warfare faced in the early years of conflict. With formidable armor and a reputation as a heavily armed fortress on tracks, the Char B-1 Bi's boasted impressive features. However, its story is also one marked by significant flaws, notably its slow speed, mechanical vulnerabilities, and the swift obsolescence it faced during the German invasion. The Char B-1 Bi's was conceived in the interwar period as part of France's response to the evolving nature of warfare, marked by the increasing importance of armored vehicles. Introduced in the mid-1930s, the tank was designed to focus primarily on robust armor protection. Its armor, particularly on the front, was exceptionally thick for its time, earning it a reputation as one of the most heavily armored tanks of the era. The frontal armor in particular could withstand significant punishment, making it a formidable adversary on the battlefield. 
Armed with a powerful 75mm howitzer and a 45mm SA-35 anti-tank gun, the Char B-1 Bias had the firepower to match its impressive armor. The thick armor and potent armament made it a formidable opponent in head-to-head -head engagements. Its role as a breakthrough tank, designed to spearhead assaults and break enemy lines, was evident in its design and armament. Despite its formidable defensive and offensive capabilities, the Char B-1 BIs was plagued by critical flaws that significantly hampered its effectiveness. One of the most glaring issues was its slow speed. Propelled by a Renault V4 12-cylinder petrol engine producing 307 horsepower, the tank struggled to achieve a top speed of around 28 kilometers per hour, equivalent to 17 mph. This lack of speed severely hindered the rapidly changing dynamics of World War II battles. The Char B-1 BIS's slow pace meant it needed help to keep up with the more agile and faster-moving German tanks, particularly during the Blitzkrieg campaigns. In the face of the German military's emphasis on mobile warfare and lightning-fast maneuvers, the Char B-1 BIs were outpaced and often unable to exploit strategic opportunities or respond effectively to evolving battlefield conditions. While the Char B-1 BIs excelled in its armor and firepower, its mechanical vulnerabilities added another layer to its list of challenges. The tank's intricate mechanical systems and the sheer weight of its heavily armored structure contributed to frequent breakdowns and maintenance issues. The crews faced an uphill battle in keeping the tank operational due to the demanding nature of its upkeep. The complexity of the Char B-1 BIS's design made it susceptible to mechanical failures, ranging from engine malfunctions to transmission issues. These breakdowns not only impeded the tank's ability to remain operational during critical moments, but also strained the logistical and maintenance capabilities of the French military. The crews found themselves grappling with the arduous task of repairing and maintaining their tanks under the pressures of wartime conditions, further exacerbating the challenges posed by the tank's mechanical vulnerabilities. The flaws were inherent in the Char B-1 BIS design were laid bare during the German invasion of France in 1940. The rapid and coordinated German blitzkrieg tactics overwhelmed the French defenses, rendering the heavily armored fortress on tracks obsolete in the face of more modern and versatile German tanks. The Char B-1 bis, while formidable in a defensive posture, struggled to adapt to the fast-paced and dynamic nature of the German offensive. The German Panzer III and IV, equipped with more powerful guns, better mobility, and superior tactical flexibility easily outmaneuvered the Char B-1 biz on the battlefield. The slow speed of the French tank made it a prime target for the German tanks, which could engage and disable it from a distance. The once formidable Char B-1 bis found itself outclassed and unable to contend with the speed and innovation displayed by the German armored forces. The legacy of the Char B-1 bis is one of the paradoxes a tank that, while earning a reputation as a heavily armored fortress, was marred by critical flaws that proved decisive in its combat performance. Its speed and mechanical reliability flaws, coupled with the evolving nature of armored warfare, led to its swift obsolescence during the early stages of World War II. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.